Good afternoon. Welcome to PRMA 130. So today we're going to talk about chapter one from the optional textbook. And essentially, this chapter is very different from the other chapters. This chapter is very conceptual. We're just going to learn a few terms and then uh, that's it. Uh, all the other chapters, we're going to be, you know, doing a lot of work on, on the board. Okay. So, <clears throat> the, the purpose of this class is to introduce you to statistics and to realize that uh, statistics or data analysis, uh, which is another name for it, is just a piece of the greater uh, research uh, process. So now we're gonna go over the components of the basic research process. The first component of the basic research process is having a motivating interest, right? Because in order for someone to be interested in conducting research in the first place, because research is a lot of work, you have to be interested. The second step, if you will, in the research process is understanding previous work and generating research questions. So you all have probably used the library website at one point, or you will in the future, to find uh, scholarly articles or journal articles for short. Okay? Once someone is interested in a certain area of research, they can go to a library website and just start searching, or even Google, or Google Scholar, right? And just finding as much information that they, that they can about the topic. And, and as one learns more and more about the topic and becomes a, an expert, if you will, they're, they're gonna inevitably have questions that don't currently have an answer. Therefore, they can generate research questions. After one has uh, generated some research questions, after one has some hypotheses, then they can go ahead and they can design a study. Uh, y you know, you, you may have participated in, in a study before, but maybe at the very least you've participated in little uh, uh, funny surveys on social media. You know, that's more or less what a study is. It's, it's, it has a bunch of, uh, you know, validated surveys that, you know, could ask questions related to depression, self-esteem, happiness, uh, you know, and the, and, the list, and, and the list goes on. So that's essentially what a study looks like. And there's, there's different types. There can be experiments, uh, observations, etc. Uh, but whatever the case, once one has some research questions they want to answer, they have to design a study in order to answer those research questions. Once a study is, de is designed, then they could go ahead 
and, and collect data. Okay, so something you might be happy about is the fact that this class just focuses on step number four, analyze the data. You know, you might have already taken a research methods class, or you will, that's the usual sequence, you take stats and then you take research methods, uh, and you'll learn about all this other stuff in, in a lot of detail, and detail I'm not going to cover. All I'm going to focus on is point number four. How do, we, how do we analyze and make sense of data? I'll go ahead and give you the last step in the research process. So, so the last step is to write research reports, to, you know, uh, create some sort of PowerPoint presentation or poster presentation and go present at conferences, you know, stuff like that. Just, you know, talk about your findings, right? And, and ultimately contribute to the literature. Get your study on the library website. The second component, and this is part of the research report, you always indicate the limitations of your study uh, basically, you know, uh, what could have been done better, for example, or, or what, what was missing, and, and then also future research needed. And essentially, what this future research needed links you back up to is motivating interest, right? Because now all of a sudden you do your study and you're like, well, uh, we should have done this, or, or here's a... Here's another question that came up based on us conducting the study, analyzing the data, and uh, discussing our findings. So it, it, the research process is really cyclical, and it's not uncommon for uh, some researchers to study the same sort of concept like, you know, uh, happiness, uh, for example, or depression, you know, for their entire career. Okay, so that's great. So that's the research process and we we fit in right there analyze the data so that's what you're going to learn to do and you're going to learn to do it really well uh, because one one thing i i, I want to point out is that we all have different roles to play in the research process But to that point, there are uh, three types of students. So there are people who want to be future, who want to be future uh, researchers, right? researchers, they, they follow the research process, right? And they produce research. Um, and they either publish it internally in their agency, or they uh, publish it in journals that you can find on uh, the library website. 
So usually these future researchers have a choice. They, they either work in an academic setting as a, as a professor, right, and have a research program, or, or they work for, for industry or the private sector. So for example, um, my full-time job is a statistical analyst uh, for a law enforcement agency, right? So there you have it. That would be a great example of industry. Okay, and then probably a lot of you, uh, based on the statistics, are going to become practitioners in your field. Okay, so in psychology, what does that look like? Well, I have a lot of students who are becoming school counselors, okay, or marriage and family therapists, or they, they aspire to be uh, clinical psychologists. Well, those are just some of the uh, practice, practitioner positions, but those individuals are going to work in the field. They're going to work with people. Where researchers work with people, but it's very different, right? They're not counseling them. Um, and I know there's some nursing students in this class, so you're going to be working with patients. You're not necessarily going to be involved in the research process. But if you're a practitioner, it's really important to understand research findings and to let those research findings impact how you practice, right? And this is known as, and you've probably heard this before, as best practices or evidence-based practices. So you need to have a pretty good understanding of, you know, the research process, well, at least a basic understanding of that, and a pretty good understanding of how to interpret results uh, so you kind of know when people are trying to pull the wool over your eyes, right? You, you have to be educated so you can understand uh, what findings are good, what findings are bad, and that's probably more research methods, right? Because that all depends on how data is collected. Uh, but what we're going to focus on here is uh, analyses and, and what you can infer based on the analyses that are done. And it's very possible that you're, you're neither going to be a future researcher nor a practitioner. And that's okay. Maybe you're taking this class because it's a, a general education requirement. That's great. We all need to be critical thinkers. Statistics are all over the place. When you turn on the TV and you hear commercials, they're throwing statistics at you. People are always trying to throw statistics at you. You need to think critically. You need to always ask the question, really, okay? You need to be super critical of any number that's thrown at you, and you need to ask for more because you're going to have enough of an understanding that you will, you will understand if a finding is probably bogus uh, or not. So take a moment just to, just to focus on that. Just to focus on which one are you? And think about how does this class fit into my goals, some goals that I have, and more importantly, what God is calling me to do.
the book has a pretty good definition of what statistical procedures are used for. Why we do data analysis. Let's go over those. So a key phrase is the first one, and it says to make sense out of data, right? Because when you're faced with data, and you'll see that in this class, it's like a big blob of numbers, but what does it mean? It's your job as a data um, analyst, okay, to, to use the tools that you're going to learn in this course to make sense of the data and that's key so remember that that's really key Okay, so make sense out of the data by organizing the data. Okay, that's actually the first thing we're going to learn. Uh, uh, chapter two, frequency, right? You take this blob of data and you organize it, okay? And you count how many values exist. So we'll get into that, but that's the simplest uh, form of data analysis. Just organize it, okay? Uh, summarizing the data. Well, you know, there's, there's different ways of summarizing the data, but, you know, the, the two uh, that come to mind would be when we, we do work on central tendency, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, and variability, okay? Uh, central tendency would be something like the mean. Everyone probably knows the mean. Taking the average, right? The average is a pretty good summary of the data. It's telling you uh, the most uh, typical value in a distribution of data. So, for example, if you have 100 self-esteem scores, um, uh, uh, that you collected from 100 participants, right? And you take the average, well, that average is going to say, well, the average self-esteem score for these 100 participants is X. Uh, and that's going to summarize the data. Uh, the other one is variability, and we'll talk about that. And that's something like standard deviation. So I think everyone's probably heard of the mean and standard deviation before. So I think that's a good uh, jumping off point. But we'll, we'll get into that. <coughs> Uh, the next one the book talks about is communicating, and then the fourth one is interpreting. But I'm going to say, uh, once you organize, summarize, you, you would then interpret the data. And at that point, you're ready to communicate your findings uh, to whoever you're communicating them to. Uh, whether it's, it's going to be other researchers or uh, people in uh, positions where they make decisions based on uh, the data that they have. So something I'm going to talk to you about that I'm not going to write on the board real quick is what does success look like in this class? Okay, so, so this class isn't that difficult in that everything is posted, right? So it's just a matter of doing it, right? So watching, watching the by hand lectures, watching the SPSS lectures, and then doing the in-class activities, which is, you know, uh, basically another problem. So you're just uh, following all the steps that we did in lecture, right? To complete your in-class activity. And then uh, the, the take-home exams are exactly like the lecture and in-class activity. Uh, so, so, you know, as long as you, you, you show up and, and you do your best, okay, you're, you're going to do well, okay. 
Um, but that's not necessarily a success in the class because essentially you can just create boilerplate language and you know uh, copy down interpretations and not really understand what they mean. But our ultimate goal in this class and, and, and what I'm going to define as success is as we learn about all these various statistical tools, um, you're, you're going to have really good notes. Notes that if you started a job somewhere and they gave you a blob of data and said, hey, tell me about it, you could apply these statistical tools uh, to those data and you can unlock uh, the, hidden, the hidden message that, that the data has. Okay, so that's ultimate success in the class. So I want you to focus on that. And, and again, I always tell my students, uh, this, this is like taking Spanish one or French one. This is like the, for a lot of you, it, it, is, it is your first uh, class in this foreign language of statistics. So, so don't be too hard on yourself, but that's, that's what we're going for. You know, we're, we're aiming high. So the next thing I want to talk about is samples versus populations. Okay, so the definition of a population given by the book is consists of all the scores of some specified population. So for example, if you're interested in studying depression, you're interested in studying every single person in the world, okay, who has depression. But again, it also depends on how you define a population. Maybe you're only interested in those in California who have depression, okay? At that point, then your population would be those in California who have depression. Maybe you're only interested in uh, those in the United States who have depression. At that point, your population would be those in the United States who have uh, depression. So really, you're defining what your population is, right? consists of all the scores of some specified group, okay? But, but it's really, no matter what you define your population as, it's going to be impossible to, to have every single, uh, uh, or, or, or to have every single, with, uh, every single person with uh, depression in your population. So what researchers work with is uh, samples. And all that a sample is, it's a subset of the population. Okay? So it makes sense, right? You're never going to have the whole population. Okay. But you might be able to collect data from a uh, hundred people, you know, within the United States or within California who have depression. So that those a hundred people would be a subset of the population. I want to cover one other topic that I think is really important. And it's this idea of a representative sample. <coughs> yeah, this is the ideal. You want 
your sample to represent the population. And why is that? Because you want to talk about the population, right? So if you're interested in people with depression in California, okay, and you have a subset of 100 Californians with depression, you're hoping that those 100 Californians with depression are representative of the total population. Okay. That's really hard to do. Okay. First of all, you would have to know okay, everyone in California who has depression. Okay. And once you know everyone in California who has depression, you have to use a random number generator, for example, something like random.org, right? And you need to uh, set your parameters between, you know, one and, I don't know, maybe there's a million or whatever. And then you would have to randomly pick people until you have a hundred. And at that point, uh, you know, Arguably, hopefully, you would have a representative sample. But this traditionally doesn't happen, just because it's, again, too, too hard to do. Uh, what traditionally happens is what's called uh, convenience. Uh, convenience sampling. And, and the data set that, that we're we're using for the SPSS uh, assignments were, uh, is, is based on a convenience sample. And, and essentially what's, what's very common at larger universities in, in particular is that, and, and again, I'm a psychologist, so this is from a psychology standpoint. So I don't know about other, other disciplines, but from, from a psychology standpoint, uh, everyone who takes psychology 101 or psychology one, it, it just introduction to psychology, they have a research requirement. So, so they can either, you know, fulfill, let's say it's six hours by going to lectures, talking about research, right? Because you can't coerce people to actually participate in research or the students can participate in research. So it works out, you know, the students participate in research, you know, they learn something uh, specifically, you know, potentially about themselves or actually how to, you know, conduct research. So it's good for the students, but it's also good for the researchers because that's a lot of the data they get. So a lot of the data they get from these uh, psychology one or introductory psychology uh, students. Uh, that's pretty convenient, isn't it? Yeah, but unfortunately, it's probably not a, a, a representative uh, sample, although it could be, but it's probably not. So I'm going to uh, reiterate formally uh, the logic behind samples and populations, and then I'm going to tie it into a very important research uh, concept, or, or you could call it a method, called meta-analysis.
concept, and I'll mark it down as number one, is the fact that sample scores infer or estimate population scores, right? And we already talked about this. We, we sample from the population and we want to, sorry, we, yeah, we sample from the population so we can make a statement about the population. And there's various statistical procedures uh, we're going to use to do that, and, and they're all called inferential statistics. And another way of saying this is we generalize findings in the sample to the population. So basically, what we find in the sample, we push up to the population, and we talk about the population based on what we find in the sample. Right. talk about the importance of meta-analyses. So I feel like by now you understand that, hey, you know, it can be problematic when we, you know, define our population, sample from it, and then we try to make statements about our population. You know, especially if we don't have a representative sample, right? So a lot of times we have a convenient sample. So, you know, are we really just, are, are our findings speaking to just our sample or are our findings speaking to the larger population? So that's the question. And this is the importance of meta-analysis. So meta-analysis is a procedure where you group all the studies that are studying the same thing. Okay, all the studies that are studying the same thing, right? So for example, maybe treatments for depression, right? Just because we're talking about depression. So you find every study looking at various treatments of, uh, uh, for depression and you aggregate them. Okay, Think about it this way. The more samples you add together, the closer you get to the population, right? And the more representative these data are of the population. So that's key. So, so this really gets us around that issue of convenient sampling and not knowing if our sample is actually representative of the population. So that's very key. So there's two types of statistics. The first type of statistics is descriptive statistics. 
Okay, so descriptive statistics consists of measures that describe a set of data. Then there are two types of descriptive statistics. The first type is central tendency. And central tendency consists of various measures that tell you the most typical value in a distribution of data. And, and what are some of these measures? Let's go over them right now. So you've probably heard of these, and we'll be going over these in chapter 3. Uh, mean, median, and mode. So those are some measures of central tendency that tell you the most typical value in a distribution of data. Okay, great. So the second descriptive statistic is variability. So these various measures of variability tell you how spread out the data are. Okay? The spread of the data. So for example, if the possible self-esteem score that an individual can have is between 1 and 7, and in your distribution of data, your, your 100, you have 90 participants who scored, did I say 1? One to seven. You had uh, 90 participants that scored between five and seven, and then 10 participants that scored between four and one. So obviously the data wouldn't be that spread out, right? Because many of them scored really high, very few scored low. Now think uh, if uh, the possible scores were between one and seven, and you had, you know, uh, 10 people scored around a one, uh, 20 people around a two, you know, 10 people around a three, uh, basically more uniformly, then uh, you could argue that the spread is greater. So that's just something to keep in mind. And again, you know, this is just a broad overview. We're gonna go over variability in chapter four in a lot of detail. So what are some measures of variability that you're uh, probably familiar with. So there's uh, the range, which is simply your maximum value in the distribution of data minus your minimum value. There's the standard deviation, uh, which is essentially your average uh, deviation of scores from the mean. And then there's variance. So again, chapter four, we're gonna go over those.
Okay, the second type of statistics is inferential statistics. I, I really like inferential statistics, and they're very important. Be, and I did mention them earlier. So what's the point of inferential statistics? Okay, it gives you a method, it gives you a means to make a statement about your larger defined population based on your sample data, okay? Using probability of sample occurrences to make statements about a population. <coughs> so for example, I'll give you a real generic form, but we're gonna get into this in so much detail that if you don't understand this right now, it doesn't really matter. But I'm just excited, so I'm gonna tell you anyway. Okay, so it's kind of like this, okay. What's the, pro what's the probability of, of seeing a relationship between depression and self-esteem in my sample data, okay, if the relationship does not exist in the population? That's the logic we use, and we're going to use it over and over again, and it's going to help us make a statement about the larger population based on our sample. The next thing we're going to talk about is what variables are and talk about different scales of measurement. Okay, so what's a variable? A variable is anything that when measured can produce two or more different scores. Well, we've been talking about depression. That's a variable, right? You ask people a bunch of questions, then you take their average response, right? People are gonna have different levels of depression. Another variable is age, right? People have different ages. Gender, people have different genders. Ethnicity or race, people have different ethnicities and races, religions, pretty much anything. Well, actually anything. That when measured can produce two or more different scores is a variable. But there are different types of variables, and this is related to scales of measurement. 
So the four scales of measurement, let me move over a little bit for you. The four scale, scales of measurement are nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. And an easy way to remember this is to remember the French word for black, which is noir. So if you take the first letter, it's N-O-I-R, noir. That's a, that's a handy way to remember it. Let's go over what these different variables look like. Okay, so something to consider when we're talking about scales of measurement, there's a stepping down process. Okay? At every step, you're determining if the variable can go one step further. So in that, we're first going to talk about nominal variables. Every single variable is at least a nominal variable. So for nominal variables, scores are used as labels, okay? So another way of thinking about this, and I mentioned it in my SPSS video for this week, is quantification. You can't do math on labels. For example, if I collect everyone's gender, male, female, male, female, male, female, I can't do math on male, female. I need numbers. Okay, so then I assign female as one and male as two. Now all of a sudden I have numbers that I could do math on. It's as simple as that. That's the idea of a nominal variable. You need to quantify the label. Okay. The key here is it has no quantitative value, meaning the number is just that. It's only a label. It doesn't mean anything else. And there's no meaningful rank, okay? Just because I assign females as one and males as two doesn't mean females are better than males, okay? So examples of nominal variables, I'm sure you could think of more. Examples include gender, ethnicity, right? Ethnicity is very similar there. Uh, religion, I think I have a few more in my notes here. political party, and, and other ID numbers, like your student ID number for Azusa Pacific. That is a nominal variable. Okay? So let's talk about the next scale of measurement. Let me write out the definition. 
So for ordinal variables, scores have a meaningful rank. Okay, so remember, every variable is at least a nominal variable. So every variable is at least nominal. You could then step down and ask the question, can these values be ranked? Is the ranking meaningful? So some examples of ordinal variables include job title, right? So at first glance, you would think job title is a nominal variable, but, okay, if you rank job title by chain of command, okay, or pay scale, all of a sudden, you can rank them in a meaningful way. Another good one is placement in a race, right? The first person comes in first, they did the best, the second person in second, the third, you see what I mean? Placement in a race, great example. Clothing size is another one, at first glance you'd be like, oh, extra small, small, medium, large, extra large, extra, extra large. Okay, some, some other examples of, of ordinal uh, variables are going to include college year. So, so if you're a uh, first year in college, your standing isn't as high as a second year or a third year or a fourth year. So clearly order. Um, another one is letter grade. At first glance, you're like, well, it's letter grade, right? We need to quantify it. It's a nominal variable. Well, you do need to quantify it. But after you quantify it, ranking matters, right? An F is not good, a, a, a D is a little better, a, a C is better, a, a B is better, and an A is best. There you have it. So next we're gonna, we're gonna talk about interval variables. Okay, so what separates interval variables from ordinal variables? It's this concept. Interval variables have an equal amount that separates an adjacent score. What? Yeah, that's kind of confusing. Uh, but it's not. So check it out. The, the example that I have are both Celsius and Fahrenheit. Let's go with Fahrenheit, right? So. The difference between 10 degrees Fahrenheit and 20 degrees Fahrenheit and the difference between 20 degrees Fahrenheit and 30 degrees Fahrenheit is what? It's 10, right? The difference between 1 degree Fahrenheit and 2 degrees Fahrenheit is 1. From 2 degrees to 3 degrees is 1. From 3 degrees and 4 degrees is 1. So there are equal intervals. Let's go back to ordinal. Job title. Well, if the ranking's based on money made, there definitely aren't equal intervals, right? There could be huge jumps between the rankings. What about placement in a race? That's a good one. Well, someone comes in first, and then the second person might come in 15 seconds after the first person, and the third person might come in five minutes after the second place person. So definitely those aren't equal intervals. Next we're going to talk about ratio.
So ratio is like interval, but zero means none of the variable is present. It means the variable doesn't exist. Or, well, you'll see. So some examples of ratio include height. Okay, check this out. Think about how tall you are. If you were zero inches tall, you would what? You would not exist, right? So zero means a lack of height. Weight, think of how much you weigh. If you weighed zero pounds, you would not exist. You would have an absence of weight. Think about time. If you have zero time, you have an absence of time. Think about money. If you have zero money, you have no money. Sure, you can go negative, but then I guess you just really have no money. But, but zero, if you have zero dollars, it means you have no money. Okay. So those are the different types of variables or scales of measurement. So let's do a quick review. So every single variable is at least a nominal variable, right? <coughs> then you step down and you ask yourself, can these variables be ranked? Or rather, sorry, can, can the values or can the scores be ranked? After that, you ask yourself, are there equal intervals between the scores? And after that, you ask yourself, is or, or, or does zero mean a lack of the variable? Okay, so that's how you really uh, determine what type of variable you're dealing with. Something to consider, though, in, in research is... Pretty much something's either nominal or not nominal. Uh, there's usually not too much distinction made uh, between ordinal interval and ratio uh, and, and, and nominal. That, that's just, you know, kind of, kind of what, what ends up happening. Okay, the last thing we're going to go over are the different types of evidence. A lot of writing on this board. Okay. Okay, let's talk about the weakest form of evidence. The weakest form of evidence is called anecdotal evidence. What is anecdotal evidence? It's like storytelling, right? You know, when you have a cold, you should drink a lot of orange juice because uh, that's gonna help you. Maybe that's what one of your friends tells you you know, I, I don't know if there's any research on that. Maybe there is, maybe there's not. Uh, but if there's not, that's pretty much just anecdotal evidence. That's, you know, making a decision based on a story that you're told. You could probably think of various examples of anecdotal evidence in play. <laughs> 
Another type of evidence is descriptive. And, and descriptive is a, is a great form of evidence. It could take the form of observation. So, I don't know, uh, observing children at play. You know, for whatever reason, maybe there's a hypothesis about social interaction. But, you know, just observational studies. Maybe observing workers at work. Um, and just sitting there and describing what you see. Another, another uh, good example would be uh, the example of case studies. I don't, you all have probably read a case study at one point, but usually a case study focuses on one individual, okay, or one organization, and it just really describes that individual or organization. So, for example, uh, a child with autism, okay, that would be a researcher interacting with the child, you know, describing what the child does, likes and dislikes, stuff like that. So that would be a descriptive evidence. The only problem, obviously, with descriptive evidence, it, uh, it, it's only related to one, one individual or one organi organization. So, so that individual is not necessarily representative of the entire population. Usually not. Correlation, correlational evidence is, is pretty cool. It's, uh, it's our attempt to start understanding the relationships uh, between things as they exist, okay, in, in, in the real world, right? So, so an example of, of correlational evidence <coughs> is actually related to the data set that we're using for our SPSS lectures. And, and, and simply how the data was collected, there were just a series of surveys, uh, for example, depression and self-esteem could have been included, uh, and people filled them out, and then we saw how they were related. Uh, so so the, the problem with, with correlational evidence, we, we don't know if self-esteem causes depression or depression causes self-esteem or if anything's going on there more than just you know understanding that they're related so that's something it's a good start and usually correlational research uh, precedes experimental research which is the next one Experimental evidence. Well, when we conduct an experiment, we can make statements of cause and effect. Okay? Otherwise, you really can't. There are some uh, quasi-experimental methods, but this is, this is the best way, an experiment. Specifically, Specifically, a randomized experiment. And what does this look like? Okay. Well, if I'm conducting a study, okay, and, and what's my study going to be? Huh. Well, let's say, check this out. So we're going we're, we're gonna to talk about this uh, eventually. But there's this concept of an independent variable, or which we could call an IV. Uh, and it's what the it's what the researcher manipulates, or the variable the researcher manipulates. When I say manipulate, I mean uh, some people have uh, one level, or 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 what to say one level of the variable, and other people have a different level. So let's get into that. So let's say I had, uh, I had a procedure, uh, self, I had a self esteem. Uh, uh, uh self-esteem manipulation. And, and and I and I had this method that either you know uh 
uh, gave people a uh, high uh, LVL stands for level or group. Okay, so my procedure either left people uh, with high self-esteem or low self-esteem. So, so let's just say, let's just say hypothetically that they just um, one one group they they read uh, statements that were talking about uh, how uh, the other participants in the room uh, or that they just interacted with thought they were really amazing, right? So it really gave them high self esteem, and then the other procedure uh, they 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 read. Uh, statements from from the same participants they had interacted with earlier, but the participants were basically saying how they thought you know this individual was not very impressive, you know something like that. But that would be an example of like a self esteem manipulation. And then, <clears throat> we would have a, a dependent variable or dv. Which um, this could be our our uh, depression score, and again, this all this all hypothetical, and we're just I'm just throwing out this uh, fabricated example for the purposes of this of this class. Okay. So my hypothesis is simply uh, those who have a manipulated self esteem that's high are going to be less depressed than those who have a manipulated self-esteem uh, that's low. So essentially we have two groups. We have those who are gonna participate in the high self-esteem manipulation and those who are gonna participate in the low self-esteem manipulation, okay? And you remember how when we were talking about a representative sample, I mentioned random.org? Well, this is another one. You could go to random.org or use a table of random numbers and, and you can set your parameters to one and two, okay? So one can represent high self-esteem, low could rep, or, uh, two could represent low self-esteem. Okay, so I kind of set up a little situation here. Let's say I was conducting this study at 7 a.m. on Monday morning, okay? And I already recruited 100 people to show up. So 100 people showed up at my door at around 7 a.m. on Monday morning. And I used that random number generator, and I sent the first person to the second group, the second person to the second group, the, uh, uh, the third person to the first group, the fourth person to the second group, the fifth person to the first group. So you can see it's random. I'm randomly assigning people to receive either the high self-esteem manipulation or the low self-esteem manipulation, right? And then subsequently, I'm measuring their, their depression scores. <coughs> so that's great, right? And the, the whole point of uh, random assignment is through randomly throwing people in one group or the other, you have a certain amount of faith that the groups are relatively the same, except that one group has that high self-esteem manipulation and one group has that low self-esteem manipulation. So then when I compare their depression averages and I find that the group that had the high self-esteem manipulation has less depression and the group that has the low self-esteem manipulation has greater depression, I can conclude that depre that excuse me, I can conclude that self-esteem level causes depression. You see that? So the key is random assignment. Random assignment is the key. Let me give you a counterexample. Let's say we didn't use random assignment. Let's say I conducted this study at 7 a.m. on Monday morning and I had a line of 100 people. Whenever they showed up, remember, it takes time to process them. They probably all didn't show up at 7 a.m. Let's say I took the first 50 people and I put them in the high self-esteem manipulation group and I took the second 50 people and I put them in the low self-esteem manipulation group. <coughs> 
Do you see a problem with that? And you should. There's a personality variable called conscientiousness. Okay? People who are high in conscientiousness are going to show up on time. They're punctual. Okay? They're very accurate people. When they take an exam, they take it twice. They read over their paper three times before they submit it. Okay. So I know, based on research, the people who show up first are likely going to be higher in conscientiousness, which is a personality trait, than those who show up later. So check this out. If I take the first 50 people and put them in the high self-esteem group, take the second 50 people and put them in the low self-esteem group, I have a problem. I have what's called a confound. I so as you can see, I was distracted. But let me get back to my punchline. Okay, so if you took the, fifth, the, the first 50 individuals and you put them in the high self-esteem condition and the second 50 individuals and you put them in the low self-esteem uh, condition, oh, he wants to run away. Uh, then you have a problem. And you know what the problem is? Now you don't know if it's the high self-esteem that's causing the low depression, okay? Or it's the fact that it's conscientiousness that's causing the low depression. So think about that. I'm going to say it one more time just to really drive, drive it home. If I find that on average, those who score high in self-esteem have lower depression than those who score low in self-esteem, I will not know if it's impacted by the fact that I didn't use random selection. And now, what I've created is a situation of confound where my high self-esteem group is confounded with high conscientiousness and my low self-esteem group is confounded with low conscientiousness. So that's the key. You use random assignment to make sure that these two groups have pretty much everything in common except for the fact that one group has high self-esteem and the other group has low self-esteem. Uh, so, so that concludes uh, types of evidence and that concludes the lecture uh, for chapter one. Uh, be sure to email me if you have any questions. I'd be very happy uh, to answer them.